This episode of Investors and Operators is about home health care, how technology is disrupting it, where the investment opportunities are, and the entrepreneurial journey of Shira Bell, CEO and founder of Care Heroes. She brings over 20 years of experience in home health care. Shira, it is awesome to have you here. And my first question is, can you give a quick explanation about what is Care Heroes? And then I have a second one lined up. Oh, it's great to be here, Jordan. Shira Bell, CEO of Care Heroes. Care Heroes is an incentive platform for anybody who's delivering care in the home. So we work with home care agencies, Medicare skilled agencies, hospitals um, to incentivize and recognize quality care delivered at home. All right. Now let's rewind a little bit. And I would love to know, how did you go from law school to home health care? That's a great question. Um, Well, midway through law school, I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, I had been in school, I was 25 at the time and realized I'd been in school for about 23 years. So I was in New York, took the New York bar and decided I was going to go sit on the beach for a little while, drove to Florida and started working in the nursing home business about six months after that. And once healthcare gets in your blood, it stays in your blood. And I've been working uh, in really the post-acute space ever since then. Wait, wait, how'd you make the jump from you moved, you moved on to Florida? Yep. How'd you go into healthcare? Like, wait, what was that jump from? Uh, go, so go by I, law school, drive down to Florida. Now I'm in healthcare. Drive down to Florida and I was waitressing and I met an executive who was running and owned about 12 nursing homes. And she, we started talking. She asked what I did. And I said, well, I'm kind of a lawyer, but not really a lawyer. And she said, well, I need a lawyer or I need someone to run my HR department. And I was like, well, I can do that. I took the New York bar. I can do anything. And I started working for her literally the next week. All right. So what was that like? I mean, can you give us a uh, a snapshot, like where, when, when was this and over what time period were you working for her? Yeah. So this was way back in 1998. So if you recall in 98 was when the nursing home industry changed their reimbursement from cost base cost plus to the prospective payment system. So it really decimated that industry. You think of Vencore, Beverly, they all kind of went bankrupt because their reimbursement got kind of really chopped by the federal government because most of their um, patients were either Medicaid or Medicare. Um, And so we actually would work with a lot of the REITs who owned those nursing homes, owned those assets, and we would go and bring those buildings back to financial and clinical stability because they were really going through a very tumultuous time. A lot of the work that we did meant, you know, going and living in a building, for example, and working side by side with nurses and CNAs. Um, and a lot of these buildings were Medicaid. So they were the second largest employer in very rural states. And, um, you know, we were on the road literally for a couple of years. We grew fast. We had about 12 nursing homes. And um, by the time we exited, we had over 100. So that was kind of where you cut your teeth, I guess it is, on the industry and kind of learned how it was mapped out, who the players are and regulations. What was kind of like the next phase of your your career leading up to to carry? Yeah, it was really a great experience because we were young, right? Like we were, you know, young and fearless and could, we lived in the building. So we saw all of the components when you think of reimbursement to operations, how do you run these post-acute facilities. And to a big part of it was around staffing. You know, how do you kind of take this workforce of nurses and aides and really have a stabilized workforce to deliver the best quality care? Um, I met my husband there. um, And so we ended up, um, he stayed there and I ended up leaving after we got married. And I started working in a home health agency. Now, home health agencies in Florida back then, this was now 2000. 2004, they were, you know, a lot of them operated as registries in strip malls. So it was literally like a list of, you know, caregivers basically. And then families would come into the strip mall and say, I need somebody to help take care of mom and dad. So forget about technology. It really was bricks and mortar, 
listing. And as I worked for these agencies, I thought, that's kind of odd. How come there isn't a match.com for this industry, right? Like, how come you can't just go and find a caregiver like you would go and find, you know, someone to date? Same model, right? I didn't have a technology background, but I figured, well, the technology is already built. I mean, you're doing the same exact thing as you are with match.com. So you're not really, don't have to reinvent kind of a brand new technology. Um, and so I just started building a database of caregivers from all the different states that had licensed caregivers. And we built a web platform. This was now you're in 2006. Um, and it was before the iPhone. So we would talk to investors then and they said, seniors will never use technology. No one will ever go online to look for a caregiver. Um, and we grew kind of fast in that from 2006 organically, just, you know, finding people found us just using web searches. And then um, in the end of 2008, we were acquired by a company that was um, led by Ben Lytle, who was building kind of a capitated risk-based model for home care. Um, so that company was acquired at the end of 2008, um, became Univita Health. And then I stayed there for a couple of years and said, oh, let's build another company in home care. And that's what started as Care Ticker, which is now Care Heroes. What was that process like going through selling your first business? What are some, maybe some takeaways from that experience? So, you know, it was, I had never done a company before. I was really kind of coming from an operation and I wasn't, remember, I wasn't really a technologist. I had a, you know, really was figuring a lot of that on my own. Um, when we sold, it was interesting because Genstar Capital was the private equity firm that acquired it. And, and Ben Lytle, um, I'll never forget when he had reached out to me, I remember Googling his name and he was the former founder of WellPoint. So he had built WellPoint into a publicly traded company and had built the brokerage side alongside of it, really a dynamic entrepreneur. And um, it was like, wow, this guy wants to buy my company and he's, you know, knows the healthcare space and he had the same vision. Um, and so we were early, right? So when they acquired us, it was, hey, come in and we're going to buy a couple other companies, but you're going to be able to really take your vision and scale it. It really didn't turn out that way, but that's okay, you know, because private equity is different than venture is one of the big learnings. Um, but it was really amazing to work side by side with someone like Ben Lytle as your first company, for him to be the first one, you know, the buyer of your first company is back then I didn't realize it. Now I realize it's a pretty big deal. So um, how much interaction did you have with Ben, you know, when you were acquired in that following, you know, two years? And I'm what I what I'm trying to get at is what what is the difference between him as an entrepreneur and the rest of us? <laughs> Uh, ben is a visionary. Like if you, and people throw that term around loosely, but if you think about it, what his vision was back then in 2008, 2009 was it makes sense now in 2022, but in 2008, nobody was looking at home care and using technology to improve patients' health and keep them at home, right? And he really saw what we see today, but back then it, it wasn't kind of a, just an automatic scaling and it works. So working side by side with someone like him, you can see where when he founded WellPoint and you know, started that, that he's got that entrepreneurial vision and then the execution of how do we kind of leverage capital either through acquisition or through bringing other you know, companies like mine in to really plug them together and sell. So he's got a very clear formula for how he builds companies. He definitely commands that vision and he can distill it down into execution, which few yeah. can do, I think. I think that word vision is interesting in the context of showing a team where they are going, mm -hmm. not necessarily. And I, and I used to believe that we didn't have this 
you know, huge change the future type of vision. And then I realized for our type of business, it, we don't have to have that. We, we have truly pioneered uh, authentic storytelling video within our pati- particular inter- uh, industry within M&A, private equity. But it's not this moonshot type of vision. Let's go to Mars, you know, you know work 24 hours a day until we get to Mars. What, what I learned as a leader together with Jing, my co-founder, business partner, and wife is like, the importance of we're not just reminding ourselves like where we're actually building this thing, but also the team where their personal vision is, how that fits up and syncs up with our team vision. Yeah. And we I need think something to be excited about. You need something excited, like what is kind of the, the big vision, right? Like what is that mission? And before Ben had acquired and my company was starting Univita, he had just sold his previous company to Healthways. And what he did there, and this is where I think he really encapsulates the word vision, is that he takes kind of mid-market companies or sometimes either companies that are in earlier stages, and he puts them together, right? So he had acquired four companies. One was on Smoking Sensation. There was um, an online wellness. And again, this was 2003, and he bought three or four put them together and sold it to Healthways for probably, you know, 400% return, right? I I think it's an interesting skill set because there are different ways to look at the world and and, and more more different, um, yeah, paradigms or just the way that we look at how, uh, what we do every day. What I mean is us as operators, we're so focused on the tactics and sometimes strategy, especially when we're getting something off the ground. But, you know, when I did six years of M&A or our clients in private equity, they're always thinking, how can that come together with that to make this bigger and better? And it's difficult to have that time in the calendar Mm -hmm. to stop, pause, reflect strategically. Mm -hmm. How have you found the time to do that? You have to toggle between both, right? Like, especially the stage that we're in, which I used to hate when people said early stage. I feel like we've been in early stage for longer. It's like emerging, it's like emerging manager in private. I'm like, well, when have you emerged? <laughs> like, I'm always in early stage, right? Um, but I think that you, you know that, right? So you're day-to-day doing the tactical parts and that build of a company at this stage, you know, and you're wearing multiple hats. So... That's one piece, but you also have to be able to sit back almost on a weekly basis to say, this is my long term. This is where I want to be. Like I always say, I'm, I'm three and a half years ahead of where we are. I already know where that needs to be. Investors that you talk to, you have to take them and, and easily show them where, what that looks like. Um, but you have to keep both. And that's hard as an entrepreneur because you know, you're in survival day to day of building this new innovative company, but you also know as you're executing, as you start to get the data points of adoption and customer base of what it should and could be year three or four. Um, and it was interesting because I read uh, there was a, uh, uh, the CEO and founder of Airbnb used to do this exercise every month where with his team where he would say, forget everything. And what is the ideal experience? And they would go through and say, okay, it's a customer getting off the airplane with the car waiting for them to someone's home that's stocked with what their preferences are with, you know, things already set up and calendared for their likes of what they want to do on a trip. Like, you know, and you and I would sit there and be like, wow, that would be insane. Yeah, it's like the, was it the 10 star experience exercise? Yes. And it's like, okay, well, what does a one star experience look like at an Airbnb? It's dirty. There are rats. There's an open door. There might or might be, you know, danger outside. And then, okay, what's a five star experience? Okay, now let's go crazy. What does a 10 star experience look yeah. like? And I, I'm glad you brought that up because I haven't thought about that in a long, in probably two years. And, and, and it, he said, right, like your 10 star experience, you know, as a CEO and as a team, you know, like, okay, you're not like, that's, you know, pie in the sky. But then when you bring it back to five star, 
it, like that look, that's realistic. We can execute and have that as a part of our vision. So I think that to me really explains how you stay short-term execution building to where you want to go long-term vision and being able to, you know, go in between those on, as a leader every day. So what's the story about Care Heroes? I mean, how did you, when did it really get off the ground and how, how has it evolved over the past, what, uh, two to three years? Yeah. So the original thesis has stayed the same, right? So very simply, it's, you know, we talk about value-based purchasing in the healthcare system every day, physician, value-based contracting, hospitals, you know, uh, driving quality outcomes and reimbursing hospitals and physicians and providers on quality, right? Versus fee for service. And a lot of that makes sense. But when you think about how people are cared for today, whether they're injured or whether they're taking care of a sick child or whether you're taking care of an aging parent, for the most part, a big chunk of that care is delivered by a family member or multiple family members trying to coordinate it, or it's being delivered by someone who you've hired, whether they're a non-certified caregiver or someone who's more specially trained. But no one ever talks about them as being critical to patient outcomes or incentivizing them for keeping people out of the hospital and the nursing home. Um, And when you think about it, you only spend, what, a couple... 15 minutes with your physician a couple of times a year or your specialist, you really don't spend that many. Your length of stay in a hospital, hopefully, is three or four days. So you're incentivizing a small subset where the people who impact outcomes the most are being ignored. And so that's why we said build an, if you had the data, you can incentivize those folks and the people who are taking risk um, will want to understand that and partner up yeah. with you on that. So- so walk us through the business model. Like, how does it actually work? Yeah. So we work with right now today, we work with home care agencies, whether you're private pay, Medicaid or skilled. And basically we collect data from them, usually simple data from like their EHR or their payroll systems or their EVV systems. And they say, these are the things that we want to incentivize our people going into the home for. You can have clinical metrics, you can have operational. And then we created what we call kind of a digital currency around caregiver incentives, which we call care coins. And as the workers in the home, whether again, they're a nurse or a therapist or an aide, achieve the benchmark set by the agency, they earn care coins and can redeem them for gift cards, dinner cards, gift cards to Target, whatever they choose. So it's almost gamification of care in the home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you want to see more care coins. Yeah. You know, and you so, just did a great service uh, with one of your patients, more care coins. Yep. So if you have a caregiver who reported that mom needs a grab bar in the home, hey, we want to know that, right? Because we can go in as a health plan and put in that grab bar. And now we've mitigated someone going into a hospital you know, or having a, yeah. um, a fall. You want to recognize that caregiver who shows up on time and delivers great care or someone who picks up an extra shift. Documentation. So any of those things that you want to recognize and incentivize, you can do through our system. And how many caregivers do you have that have been using this? We have well over 10,000 across the country that are working independently or working for um, agencies, you know, kind of in this early phase. And they come onto the system every, you know, see how many care coins they have. If they have enough, they redeem them for gift cards. And in today's market, the biggest thing for this workforce is, you know, they're not paid well um, and they live paycheck to paycheck. So imagine the value of having a gas card or a Walmart gift card to get food is really supplements their income. One of the interesting challenges in a good way with any startup technology is to figure out how the heck do I even charge for this? Mm-hmm. I mean, what has been your discovery process with pricing? So the way we've figured out pricing was our main customer today at the home care agencies, we are solving one of the biggest pain points they have, which is how do I recruit staff? How do I retain staff? And how do I 
have the staff kind of do the things that we want them to do to drive quality care and drive our operational metrics. Um, so we realize, well, they will pay for this, right? So we charge them an implementation fee and then they pay, you know, a per caregiver per month fee and they cover the cost of the rewards. But the cost of the program, the ROI is so high because we reduce their missed shifts. Um, they can cause, you know, a couple thousand dollars a day for them to fill shifts of caregivers because they lose revenue on that. It costs them an average $500 a to hire a caregiver, we impact retention and we can supplement their workforce as well. The pricing model has been fairly straightforward to figure out on them as a customer. The health plans, we believe as we scale with them, will not only pay to provide the system to their provider network, but think about them subsidizing the rewards for the caregivers. Because again, if you're at risk as a health plan, you want your member home, give the caregiver some incentives or risk having them be put in the nursing home that costs you over $100,000 a year. So kind of stepping outside of your business, but still within the home health care context, where do you see are some of the interesting investment opportunities or areas for disruption? Uh, so, I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, buzzwords around hospital at home. Um, I think we've always had that model. I think COVID accelerated it, brought it more to the forefront of understanding that care can be delivered in the home, both acutely and non-acute. Um, and I think right now it's still the process when you leave a hospital and you go home of, you know, coordinating those providers and getting the things that you need is still faxed, right? There's, I mean, think about that for a minute. I was talking to a provider the other day who says, we still fax in order for DME equipment, or we still fax something of, can we get approval for this caregiver to deliver care? So I think any, any logistical part of coordination, the services of care in the home is still ripe for a lot of disruption. And you're going to see a lot more investment flowing into it, whether it's on the DME side or on the home health is still very fragmented. So I think you're going to see a lot of consolidation. I think the private equity firms are going to be buying up a lot more of the companion type agencies, the franchises. We've seen some interesting deals already happening. You got United buying LHC. I think that was a big signal to the market coming from a large, the largest plan of saying, we want to own this non-clinical, you know, caregiver support in the home. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And it's, and it's a continuing to be a big opportunity. The issue is, is where we, where we find that we're going to be well poised in that market is there's not enough people to service, yeah. you know, them. So we ultimately can supplement that as well. So let's think uh, creatively on m a what would be a crazy deal that would happen from a very unlikely buyer like oh my god why were they doing that oh now i see this i'm talking about things that are not obvious and it's okay if you don't have an answer for this but i'm just trying oh, to think a little more that's such a good question you should have given me that question like two days ahead like for my kids. <laughs> thought about it um <laughs> Uh, let's see, a crazy non-obvious deal. Hmm, I need to think about that. Ask me some other questions and I'll think about it. We'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, well, let's kind of go to one, one of my favorite uh, topics is around the rough patches we've been through in our careers and our entrepreneurial journeys. But those in retrospect made us better people, made us better businesses, made us better teams. Uh, so in this newly titled segment called This Made Us Better, um, what is an example from your entrepreneurial journey of something that has made you better, but at the time, it's a little bit painful? Um, okay, so I had a deal to sell my company by somebody who is, you know, well, well known, like, you know, hugely known, 
would have been. And the only reason why I wanted to do the deal was because of this person being the leader, right? And had an LOL signed, haven't taken any outside capital. The agreement was we're going to you know, take our model, buy a couple other companies, et cetera. Two weeks before we're supposed to close, deal doesn't go through, right? Now, remember, I had one very, very large health plan customer that was kind of one of our core customers. Um, and that person had very close connections to that customer. And so we lost the deal. Okay. So now I'm like an entrepreneur crying in the corner in a fetal position because I just was going to have another exit, could pause and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And then six months later, I lost my largest customer revenue wise, right? Crying in the corner again. And, you know, people have always say that line, the highs will be very high. The lows will be very low. I, I really experienced a new level of low. I don't know if, ever, you know, because you're sitting there and you're like, how do I, what do I do next? You know, like, what do I do next? I, I now I'm looking at my bank account and looking at my revenue. Can I cover payroll? Can I execute what we promised our customers? And is this going to work? You know, you're really on that line of, I think we're, we're on life support and we're not going to make it. And, you know, when you're a CEO that's passionate about your vision and you've been in it for a couple of years, that's a hard place to be. So um, I will say that that, you know, is extraordinarily hard. The reason why I think it's the best thing that happened to me, because it really forced me to sit back and see, is this model working? And is this scaling in the path that is this a real company that I'm building? And what I realized was I was building a company for one very, very big, sexy customer. And that wasn't the right path, right? And so we started calling the people that we were doing work with through the health plan, started working with them directly. And now we've got, like you say, 10,000 doesn't seem like a huge number. Well, we had like two people using the system. And within three months, we went to 10,000. And that's enormous, right? As an early stage founder. Um, but it was the, that was one of the hardest things I've ever been through. You know? Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to hear that because when we first go through it, it seems like the end of the world. And then every time we go through some version of that, in subsequent years, the we 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 have some scar tissue. We're like, oh, wait a second, I've been through that. Yeah, I, I can get through it. And it's just interesting in how, I guess that's something called experience. <laughs> and I think the thing that's important if there's entrepreneurs watching this is what I had was I had a few people that were mentors, colleagues that I called and literally called in hysterics, right? Like, I'm gonna shut it down, this isn't gonna work, I am nothing. Like what you say to yourself in that time as an entrepreneur, you can be very hard. And one of them um, said to me, you have freedom. Like go, if you were being handcuffed with you know, this one customer or these people are gonna buy you, now you have the freedom to go do what you wanted to do. Another one said, keep on going, you know, just listen at the signals and to have those people talk you through it without judgment. A board won't do that, right? If you've got investors on your board, you can't call them hysterical saying, you know, I just want to give up and, and I can't function. And, you know, this is the worst thing that's happened to me. You have to be like, we're good. Revenues are moving forward. Growth is like this. It's up all good. to the right. No, but no big deal. Meanwhile, you hang up the phone and you're just, you know, a mess. I think the reality of entrepreneurism and doing these in doing companies is you're going to have that experience and you have to have those couple of people to lean on and during those times. Um, but I don't know if the, the, you know, my ultimate goal is to, to prove those guys, like to sit back and they're going to call me up and be like, man, we made a mistake of not closing that deal. Right. So it's we'll see. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I've had a similar thing in psychology in terms of the proven people wrong psychology. And I think 
there's an element of some small part of having a chip on our shoulder that does motivate us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a healthy tension, but it can't be over overwhelming or, or, or all consuming. And I think I, I had that in the, maybe the first year or two in this, in this five-year entrepreneurial journey, because it was mainly trying to signal to what I left in investment banking, like, Oh guys, I'm doing okay. Look at this. I'm like, uh, it sucks. <laughs> it's not as sexy as it is. thought it was. Um, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder doing it, starting a business. Um, I think that's where you just have to really, it sounds corny. You really have to believe in kind of like what I said, the, our initial thesis has never changed, which is the people in the home delivering care are the most important. Yeah. They should be incentivized and they impact outcomes the most. Yeah. That hasn't changed from whether we were working with a plan or someone going to buy us or home care or private people. It, it stays the same. And so I think, you know, I think it was um, uh, the CEO, founder of LinkedIn, who said you need to be contrarian and right at the same time, you know, to really be successful as an entrepreneur. And I think that's what you have to do when you yep. hit those hard times. That's such a, I'm glad you reminded me of that because it's not a black and white issue. There is no right answer. It's like right that day. And in fact, I have a, I have a book right here by one of our clients, uh, uh, one of our clients. And he said, this book is really framed for us called getting the right things done. And I looked at my project management tool and the, you know, the 20 tasks and I see importance and urgency, the Eisenhower matrix, and everything is high and everything is urgent. I'm like, Oh man, this is really the entrepreneurial dilemma. Mm -hmm. like, well, what's most urgent? <laughs> what's, what's most important today, right now? And being willing to accept that there will be things that will fall through the cracks. It is part of small business, early business. How, yeah, how and you, you know, you know, Rob Hayes at first round capital, he he told me he said the same thing. He goes, Shire, sometimes you're focusing so much on the urgent things as a leader but you're not focusing on the important thing, you know, and, and there's a couple of important things is in early stage lead, you know, your, your cash flow, you know, getting the product big, right. Can you scale it? Those sort of things. So, um, how would you kind of, uh, summarize your why for entrepreneurship? Not necessarily for this, it could be for this particular business, but more broadly, your, raison d'etre for entrepreneurship? Uh, to, well, I mean, besides the fact that it's a disease, you know, like <laughs> I think entrepreneurs are, are, it's, it's a challenge that's unlike any others, right? Can you build something that someone will pay for that people will love that they've you've impacted them in some way, um, regardless of what type of product it is. Um, so I think um, for me, the why is when I did my first company, it was early, right? I it was two years, so I really didn't see a company from early stage to really growing and running and operating it to a, you know, a, a, you know, whether it's publicly traded or exit. And um, so I think that is exciting. Can you build something from the ground up that at some point is going to be kind of of real substance? And my first one, I didn't really get to do that. Um, but I like taking traditional models and trying to, you know, move them in a different way and to see if it can fit into a marketplace. Right. Yeah. Like when I did my first company, it was why you've got this old stodgy industry of healthcare being operated out of strip malls and no one's using any technology. Can you apply that to that, that industry? And, and I think we were early um, you're seeing companies now with billion dollar valuations that are doing the same thing we were doing back then. Um, so that's part of the why. I think the other thing for me is in healthcare, um, healthcare for me is a great industry to be an entrepreneur in because you really, if you do it and if you can execute, you really can impact people on kind of a very local level, which excites me. That's awesome. Yeah, I've reflected on this question a lot. I'm thinking, or I've come to the conclusion that it's it's not at all about, to, for me, it hasn't, that whole thing of 
wealth creation, it's that was like the first three years, but now in year four and five, what I've discovered is that, um, you know, 38 now, and I'm like, you know what? Time is limited and I want to have the freedom to create what we want, when we want, and how we want. Mm-hmm. And not just in business, but in life design. Mm-hmm. And fundamentally, entrepreneurship is the greatest vehicle to live the life that we want. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I've discovered. I, I, I think so. I mean, um, listen, I haven't taken a salary in like eight years, right? And so when we, when we started after I sold my last company, you know, I have two daughters and it was healthcare then was just being kind of digital health. It was 2009. You saw Rock Health had just started. Digital health was like big buzz. And I sat back and I was like, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I could go get a, a job and I call it kind of collect paycheck, be a direct depositor, right? No offense to anybody doing that. Or I can kind of go and do this and figure it out. And if it works out great, if it doesn't, I don't, you know, I'll, we'll still be okay. And can I show my daughters that there's a world out there now that you really can have an idea and try to execute on it and, you know, see if you can take it somewhere. Um, so yeah, wealth creation to me, it's not, that doesn't really drive. I don't think most entrepreneurs, I think that's kind of like, oh, it'd be great if this works out like that, but you can't build, I think, a real company with that as your your goal. Yeah, it, it's. I, I always have this kind of FOMO whenever we go to our clients, and I, I'm walking in because we our clients are in investment banking, private equity, et cetera. And I'm like, what if I went down and I stayed down that track? And then I realized, like, I was an average banker. <laughs> I could barely count two plus two. I love the deal making. But fundamentally, like it just wasn't a fit in the long run. And, and yeah. this ability to create in the direction that we want, this has become like to have that blank canvas mm-hmm. and to say, you know what, let's go try this. Like that creative freedom is yep. our ultimate why. So and I do you- think you did ask the question around um, like in those dark days, right? When you've had those I always would go and talk to one or two of like my users, right? Because our end users, the caregivers, they, they're like, this is the greatest thing, you know? So yep. start to build something where it's not just, oh, I like it. It's a nice to have, but they really are coming back and saying, I love it. You know, that is what kind of keeps you going. So um, I don't know how much time we have, but- I literally have a, do- a document on my journal called Oxygen. And that document, I, I copy and paste. It's happened for you know years now. Just little things on like, hey, keep going. That's the message to myself. It's like, all right, here's a, just a small example. Stay, stay in the fight. Yep, yep. So um, the most, I think a deal that would be really interesting would be like um, if you think about a company like um, <clears throat> Salesforce, right? Going in and buying um, a staffing agency of caregivers, right? That would be interesting. I don't think people would see like, why would Salesforce want to own that workforce? But it can be monetized all day long. That would be a very interesting deal. Um, well, because fundamentally, Salesforce has is that infrastructure for customer interactions being a CR. Yeah. And if you think about what drives referrals from hospital to home, it's a very old, you know, you've got community liaisons, like bringing donuts to the doctors to try to get referrals to their agency. That still happens today. I'm like, I want to be like a Salesforce, just scoop up a whole bunch of those and just, you know, own it, you know, in a big way. There that we would, go. That, crazy that would, deal. That would be a crazy deal. <laughs> well, I guess we'll call that de- new another newly titled segment called Crazy Deal. Yeah, you have like Mark Benoff, like having like nurse aides, like on his, you know, inviting a hundred of them to like a big conference and like building them up and being like, you guys can be the, you guys could be the sales, the, the people that drives referrals and make more money. You know, most of them make 22 grand a year. So can you take a workforce like this? 
and say, we're to, you're the most important workforce and lift them up. And now they're earning, you know, a, a good salary and feeling good about themselves and keeping people at home. It's just such a win. So what yeah. Is the, what is the average caregiver sa- uh, salary? The average of so your caregiver, they're making probably anywhere between 13 to $18 an hour. 18 is your very high, high level maximum. So what is, they, what is the average Starbucks wage? Uh, 15 to 16. So we're valuing the people who take care of loved ones the same as a Starbucks barista. Uh, usually we value them lower. Yep. Yep. So, and, and when I started Care Heroes, you know, the industry has always looked at the work that's being delivered at home as not important. So that, you know, think about it. They call, you know, caregivers who aren't nurses. Well, you're not certified or you're unskilled. And you're like, you've got one of the most important workforces that keeps people at home that's doing work that typically has been looked down upon. But now it took a pandemic where people realized, oh, it is really important when, you know, Kadisha takes Mr. Bell to church for an hour, right? Or to get his haircut. Those are the things that one, make people feel good, make them feel human and alive, but it also keeps them at home. It keeps them out of the institutional setting. Um, and so we, we need to flip that and we need to look at them as they're much more important than those hedge fund bankers making a lot of money. Um, so the health plans need to start seeing that, right? Like health plans on the Medicaid side, they only reimburse caregivers going to the home 11 to $12 an hour. And they're like, well, we, we can't find caregivers. We can't find people to stay. Well, <laughs> you're, most of your caregivers are actually, you know, on Medicaid as well, because we're not paying them. So I think those are the things that we have to And that's through. fundamentally what we're trying to do with this incentivization platform and technology is to find a way that they can be compensated, keep them motivated, keep them retained and and, and staying in the, in the industry. Yeah. So if you think about like my uh, 10 star vision, right. It would be, you take that, you know, aid in, in Rockville, Tennessee, and say, you've been a caregiver for four years. We know all the quality of work that you've done for those four years. And now we're going to incentivize you to, we just did a deal with Nevon on online training and learning. So now we're going to take you and, you know, incentivize you to, you know, learn more, grow more and, you know, grow in your profession. Can you become certified to be a specialist caregiver in Alzheimer's or, and you can earn more too. So those are the things that we need to start doing to, to really embrace that workforce to, to have, they are gonna, they're not in it for the money now. So imagine if you take them and say, hey, we're gonna build you up and continue, yeah. It, yeah. it's pretty powerful. Well, this has been a wide ranging conversation and I appreciate you taking the time for this. Absolutely. I've enjoyed it. And uh, I'm still going to think about more unique mergers because I think uh, we'll see some M&A stuff coming out. That'll be interesting. That'll be the third newly titled segment called Better Know a Crazy M&A Healthcare Deal. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank Thanks you so for much. Your time. Have a great day. Yeah.